I'm Nolan Bowerly. I program Bitcoin Magazine's live shows, and uh, we have a great time doing it. We've been uh, creating some of the most cutting-edge live content in the space. We're sort of on top of the target, uh, at the top of these big narratives and stuff like that. And the way we do that across the Wall Street field and the energy field and the mining field and the technology field and the cryptography field is by meeting with the smartest people in each of these industries. And we do a lot of consultations. And one of those people who is generous with her time and her bird's eye view of the mining industry is Amanda Fabiano. So Amanda, that's the context for our listeners here for uh, for for how you help us come up with great programming. And you're also a speaker at our show. Oh, thank you. You're, you're yeah. a participant. It's fun. A real operator. <laughs> yeah, it's it's um it's great to work with you guys. I think it's awesome to help be able to put what we see in the mining industry on stage. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversations that happen and people working on cool things and it's really good to be able to have you know, people who aren't in that part of the industry or that are more curious about what others are looking at um, have a platform. And, you know, Nolan, you do a great job at put, pulling all of those puzzle pieces together. Well, uh, we, we, we are so obsessed with Bitcoin that what would we be doing otherwise with our time, right? Besides thinking about Bitcoin and these things. Yeah, Craig and I were actually in, um, we were in Costa Rica last week thinking about Bitcoin at a really cool place. Um, it was the Bitcoin jungle um, in Uvita, Costa Rica. And it was really cool. Like every, there was a marketplace and every single vendor just accepted Bitcoin. And so it was, it was like a really unique and interesting experience where like it, it was quick and easy. And, you know, I paid for like rice and beans with Bitcoin and it was um, very interesting. Craig would love to get your thoughts on how you thought that event went. Yeah, the event was awesome. Um, but like you said, my favorite part was just being able to, to spend Bitcoin with the local merchants. It was not just the vendors like at the marketplace at the, it, the conference, but it was also like pretty much every vendor in town, every merchant, every business accepted Bitcoin. And it wasn't like in the U.S. where it's like if you find a place where they accept Bitcoin, you, you uh, ask to pay in Bitcoin and they like have to go get the one guy who knows how to actually accept bitcoin if they're even on on duty that day and they're like oh god here we go um but when when you asked to pay in bitcoin uh they the vendors at in bitcoin jungle they were all like thrilled and just happy that you were there and happy to take your bitcoin so i just found that experience like really um heartening to see bitcoin adoption from this like grassroots standpoint i mean it it really was like every single business i paid for sushi with bitcoin i bought local meat from the rancher um from the butcher shop in bitcoin and then not to mention all of the the vendors who were at the conference selling their wares i think my wife got two dresses that i paid for in bitcoin so it was it was just really cool to see bitcoin jungle highly recommend everybody go check it out in uvita costa rica Craig, at one point, those are going to become really expensive dresses. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they definitely will be. <laughs> I think your description to me, Craig, when I got when you got back from that week was that the uh, Uvita situation is sort of a much more organic version of what's going on in El Salvador. And because it's sort of a little more decentralized, it's a little more uh, robust and authentic. Uh, but one thing they have down in El Salvador that I haven't heard if they have in Costa Rica yet is volcano bonds and mining Bitcoin with volcanoes and the mining industry and the energy industry. Amanda, was there anything interesting down there uh, that you know about in, in, in terms of Costa Rica, not just merchants, but anything on the uh, energy level happening there? So the energy in Costa Rica is quite expensive, so I don't think it's like a natural place where Bitcoiners flock to. But what's really cool and what we talked about a little bit was there is a lot of land for sale that you can literally buy a, a waterfall. <laughs> um, and that land isn't as expensive as like, say, like in Boston or New York. Right. So there is like a world that exists where people could buy a waterfall and use hydroelectricity to mine Bitcoin. We didn't experience anyone doing that, particularly in Costa Rica. Um but there was a lot of conversation around like how could people get into mining here and that was like a very clear path. Oh, and we've got Will joining us. Hey, Will. 
Hey. Oh, I see Anthony Power there too. Okay, we got a whole big gang of uh, incredible mining people. We're we're, we're going to be moving on quickly from uh, beaches and talk like that. We're 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 moving deep into mining now. Cool. Thanks for having me up. Good to talk with you again, Nolan. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having the show. Hey, Anthony. Great. Yeah. So uh, while you guys were in Costa Rica last week, I did notice that they had the um, Energy and Mining Summit in Nashville. The Bitcoin uh, Park folks were there. Nashville Energy and Mining Summit. And I did have a look. I saw that Marty Bent shared some of his thoughts. Uh, and I just wanted to check, you know, they seem realistic and, and interesting. But as someone who's programming our event, we've also got the May 9th and 10th event in Hong Kong. We'll be talking about mining as well there. Uh, but for the Nashville event, uh, which is July 25th to 27th, uh, seeing this program, of course, there's a lot of stuff for me to absorb and try to integrate into our own. Uh, they did talk, M Marty's reflections first were on the geographic distribution of hash rate, talked a lot about Texas and the energy literacy that continues to uh, blow the world away in the sense that Texas, with every storm, with every new um, uh, event that happens there, ERCOT and others are learning more about Bitcoin. Uh, he talked about how energy professionals are here uh, and that the um, um, people who understand the complexities of purchase agreements and everything are now saturating the industry, not just uh, showing up. So I'd like, you know, just some of your thoughts on that. I know there's a lot there, but Amanda, you were here first and uh, you, you missed this event, uh, but I just wondered if you heard anything about it and, and what you thought about Marty's. Yeah, I had like se severe FOMO from not going to that because I think it sounds like an incredible event with you know some great speakers and some, it's. I prefer like the, sometimes like in mining, the smaller events are really helpful, right? To be able to have some very good conversations. I think Marty is completely spot on. Um, I'm actually in Texas right now. I went out to the Chola site yesterday to visit the Giga Hydro Box. And, you know, I met with some people that are you know, working in the industry and a lot of groups are bringing on people from the power side of the, of, you know, the traditional industries. I am also, you know, in, June, we hosted an event while I was still at Galaxy where we had some really large miners. And a question I asked was, how many of you had a power team a year ago? And everyone said no. And it was, how many of you have a power team now? And everyone raised their hand. So I think, you know, th that is very true what Marty is saying, that there is this natural like synergy where people from power are seeing like the benefits and also the opportunities in Bitcoin mining and they're, they're shifting over. Yeah, that's what it sounds like, because the picture he painted is that most folks, when they went into the last uh, epoch and the last market, they just really weren't even armed to understand what purchase agreements were and things like that. Will, is that something you've been covering in your uh, podcast? Is that something you're seeing out there that you're starting to see these people that are not so much energy literate, but energy markets literate that are really starting to join in and, and, and help Bitcoin continue to grow in the uh, energy field in America? Hey, yeah, great question. I think Amanda and I talk about it in DMs more than I talk about on the show. It's like a very specific topic. And I think it will definitely grow. There's more interest in energy markets right now, but there's mainly been like the same brokers and the energy side of Bitcoin for a while now. Like the first one that comes to mind is like Priority Power. Uh, there's like a handful of other people out there like Pump Jack, stuff like that. And they've been doing energy Bitcoin mining for quite a while. They're specialists on this now. They've dedicated sales team. They actually have like, you know, megawatts to gigawatts of power in their brokerage deck, in their like desks. Um, I think that like Bitcoin mining companies, like Amanda said, are becoming more savvy with it. Uh, you're seeing in a few places where like treasury management is now a thing. Um, I'm just gonna keep referencing Amanda, even though she's on stage, but she was like a big pioneer for like mining finance at Galaxy. And no one was really doing that two or three years ago. And then we saw like all these companies explode. Well, okay, now we're in a new cycle people are actually like, taking that advice and building out teams internally to be able to manage their finances correctly. Uh, so we've, we've seen a few announcements from that. I think we're seeing the same thing with energy markets, right? Where like people are becoming more savvy and being like, oh, I'm a big miner that has hundreds of megawatts under management. 
maybe I should have an energy desk that's able to speak fluently and speak this language. From like the energy sector side, like I think it's growing maybe from like a public awareness perspective for like a lot of the regulators and ISOs out there. But I haven't heard of a lot of other energy companies necessarily like entering the space directly. Uh, it's also really hard to know though. Like these companies are very corporate and they don't talk to people like me. They talk to people who are, you know, have, have big checks to sign. But if you're willing to like intro me to anybody, let me know because mm-hmm. I'd love to talk to them. Well, we we definitely want to get folks like ERCOT involved with our event. That's for sure. Uh, knowing what Texas is learning, seeing what's going on over there, um, seeing the the literacy of the of the utility itself, understanding the benefits of of load balancing, uh, and also wondering about the um, the the geographic distribution again of hash rate. And seeing, you know, there's rumblings over in China uh, that things are about to change or could change or might change. Um, and and understanding exactly what's going on where from a regulatory point of view. Anthony, um, you know, I'm wondering, uh, did you hear those comments on that, that Marty made just about this geographic distribution, Texas learning, some jurisdictions learning, some jurisdictions changing their mind now suddenly? And, and what it means for uh, human capital. Um, I didn't specifically hear those those comments, but I mean, I I concur with what both Amanda and Will have been uh, been saying about um, about energy. I, I I was sort of I mean, I think Fred Fred Teal mentioned well over a year ago that he he foresaw the the big energy companies coming into this space in four or five years time. And I don't know if that's still the way forward. I mean, energy is the largest cost. For all these miners it's not the machines it's not the infrastructure it's the energy itself and so you know for these miners to succeed they've got to find the lowest energy cost and that might actually be in the future zero cost they might be you know that that's where it might end up going to getting stranded energy and and utilizing it at very very significantly low cost um because we know you know once the harming occurs the time it takes to mine a block will, will take twice as long as it does at the moment and therefore, the energy price itself will effectively double overnight. Um, we are seeing, you know, some innovative uh, ways of, of getting some strand energy. I mean, there's, I, I can't believe there's actually companies in the UK which, you know, our domestic price and our industrial price here is something like close to 25 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's, it's just not practical to mine Bitcoin. But there are these companies here that are, you know, looking at converting animal waste into electricity the methane gas and they're now going into the landfill as well now so you know there are pockets of these companies going up there being innovative looking at you know but it's on a small scale at the moment they're looking at the model and then trying to then sell the model to bigger areas i mean because landfill affects the whole world so you know you can go in there and 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 and, and reclaim energy from landfill sites from the methane gas there you, you know you could be on something really good but it, it's getting that model across to the companies that own the sites um, to say we'll go in there and do something and maybe you know have some sort of a profit share agreement but yeah energy is you know it's it's just going to double every every four years and the next doubling happens in you know in literally a, you know about 10 weeks time so when we get to the next halving but um yeah it's it's important and i i've raised it on on a lot of the podcasts i've been involved in last in the last few weeks you know you've seen the miners last um, five or six months come out with these really big orders for, for efficient machines and having these more efficient machines means you're reducing your energy cost to mine a bitcoin so if you look at the s21 t21 models and compare that to the s19 it's taking about half the cost to mine a bitcoin that the s19 does so again you know you're seeing these big big orders uh, coming through from the likes of clean spark from the likes of iris energy um, from the likes of riot uh, using the micro bt equivalent models um, but some some phenomenally big orders and some some phenomenally big option orders as well. So potential to grow even further than what their their, their current growth strategies are. But um, it's it's interesting space. Um, I, I I did wonder if we'd see more energy companies sort of like come in and highlight. But I think Will Will touched on that, and you know maybe they they maybe they are involved, but they don't want to be public about it at the moment. Maybe they are sort of like slowly getting a a piece of the um, of the industry. And we'll come out at a certain time. So, um, but yeah, it's it's all possible. 
Well, incentives matter in this, and I know that a lot of these alternative energy systems in terms of finance have relied heavily on government subsidy and uh, green energy programs, but it seems like some of these are starting to dry up. The very week that the Bitcoin ETF launched, BlackRock, I think, shut its ESG, uh, you know, that laid off a bunch of people and all that kind of stuff. So I'm wondering, um, it, it, you know, Amanda, you're on the cutting edge of mining and finance. And of course, the energy literacy part was important. But is there any, you know, I'm, I'm trying to program a few months out. But is there any thought on the horizon that there is going to be a vacuum and an opportunity for Bitcoin to start getting involved in energy finance at a much larger scale, or at least some of these folks cluing into that so that the incentives start aligning more with Bitcoin versus government ESG handouts and things like that? Oh, ESG. Yeah. Um, so I think that on the energy side of things, like there were some companies in the last cycle that started to, you know, dip their toes into like, oh, what are the opportunities with Bitcoin miners? And some of them got wrecked. Right. So I think that was the difficult part. And that was because in 2022, we saw like the perfect storm of everything going wrong with mining, Bitcoin prices dropping, capital markets closing, energy prices just skyrocketing. And so it just became like a back burner item. Um, these larger energy companies are like moving the Titanic, right? And so I think you got to find like a couple people that are really interested in it internally. And you know, how do you find them, right? How do you get to them? So I would love to see energy companies start to move towards like Bitcoin, especially because it is the perfect ESG story, if that's something that they're still, you know, pursuing. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like maybe we'll see it in this cycle, but like what, there has to be some like general, um, I think like Bitcoin narrative that is positive and like mainstream media and government for us to see that. So we're not at the point where, you know, in finance, for example, uh, the big banks and the Black Rocks couldn't ignore the Bitcoin narrative for another couple of years. Finally, it started to influence enough professional people within their industry. It started to affect enough um, you know, financial professionals who it touched directly. But we're not quite there in the energy industry is what you're saying, that the, the trickle up effect within the corporate bodies that help uh, build energy systems, maintain them, grow them, run them, finance them, still don't have that saturation. I haven't seen that. And the other piece is like Bitcoiners will flock to the cheapest form of energy. And sometimes like that there is not there's like, oh, well, we can work together, but I'm going to need X investment. Right. And miners just like capital is always a constraint. Like Anthony noted, there's a lot of capital that needs to be spent on the you know hardware refresh ahead of the having, And, you know, there's it's not like this ultimate open door for miners to continuously have capital. So they have to be very specific about where they spend it. Got it. Now, you know, one, one of my big questions that I have around programming this year will be around how to frame a lot of the geographic questions. Uh, I know, for example, Canada, uh, with some new accounting, uh, seems to be uh, becoming more revolting to Bitcoin miners for a reason that I don't, I'm not quite clear on. If someone can help me uh, understand that better, that would be awesome. And uh, furthermore, you're, you are seeing jurisdictions that are still being hostile uh, versus jurisdictions that are being a lot more uh, open and, and seeming to have an appetite and thirst. Um, so how should I frame this regulatory piece this year? Is it really just batched ad hoc? Are there themes there that I, that I can uh, communicate um, you know, like I said, Canada looks like it's, it's embracing get the hell out of here miners. I'm not sure if I can see it in another way. Um, but, but educate me, please, uh, Will. Just to clarify your question, you're asking me like how regulators are looking at mining into 2024. Um, the most, uh, revolting places versus the most attractive. Uh, and if my narrative uh, about Canada being like going further to, uh, kick people out is, is true. Gotcha. Good question. Uh, my mind immediately just goes to talk about Texas where all the hash rate is. We even saw Bitcoin blocks slow down a lot during the cold weather there the other day. So I think if you're getting to that point, then you probably have too much mining um, concentration in one area. That's just my perspective. But I do think that's going to be like an increasing and growing political 
problem over the next few years because there are so many Bitcoin miners and there's going to be some takes that there's too much energy consumption there. The narrative, of course, has been you know, we're helping to levelize the grid, all those sort of things. But the counterpoint also is that Bitcoin miners are coming in there and helping to build out not renewable energy that isn't very uh, useful for the grid. Um, a lot of people think like baseload gr- energy is going to be more important there long terms, long term, and Bitcoin miners are not helping to build that out, which could lead to like some political strife. So I'm curious about like that sector in the next few years. I think a lot of people think that Texas is Bitcoin country. I think it is right now, but I think that could change. Um, the U.S. in general always is very stable. Uh, you know, the capital markets are here. Things are very definite in terms of like law. So there's not a lot of tons of concerns. Canada, always tough. I mean, the I think the uh, two-year anniversary, whatever happened with the truckers was pretty recently. And that is always in the back of your mind, right? As long as there's the Trudeau administration, there's always going to be concern about energy and concern about people using Bitcoin up there. So that's just something to watch. Um, and then I think lastly that my mind goes to Latin America, especially with Tether and their investments in that area. You know, I had Paulo on my show a few months ago. They're definitely wanting to invest more in Latin America. And Latin America has a history of uh, populist actions taking over industries, um, but they're also wanting to grow in this sector. I, I just see so many publications and people trying to attend events and speak at events from Brazil or the greater Latin America. And so I do think like there's going to be more concentration and interest for Bitcoin miners and others to go down there. How that plays into like the history of Latin American populist movements is is something that I'm just going to watch and enjoy from a, from my purview. I don't have a lot of insights into it. Well, do you see hash rate uh, expanding to other geographic regions? Like I know that there's a lot of places in the Middle East that are are starting to kind of do some research and they're they're very energy rich, energy dense places. Do you see like certain regions or certain areas or countries in that space or uh, elsewhere around the world that might help with the current concentration of hash rate that's, you know, mostly in Texas and the U.S. at large? Yeah, I sure hope so. I think there's too much hash rate in the U.S. right now. I think we broke past that point a little bit ago. Uh, In terms of other jurisdictions, I think Amanda's point earlier, like miners will just go where one, cheap energy, two, decent rule of law. Uh, there's a few instructive stories about this over the last few years. Kazakhstan, for instance, was a huge mining hub. It's basically gone to zero because they implemented some tax policies there. And all the Kazakh miners just moved across the border, and border into Russia. And that's a decent reason why there was a lot of growth in Russian mining this last year. Not the complete reason, but a decent reason for it. Uh, and again, it just comes down to cheap energy and decent rule of law. Like if you're a Bitcoin miner that is location agnostic, you essentially just don't want to lose your capital and you want to make sure that you get a return on your investment long term. So wherever that's possible, and I think the Middle Eastern mining does make sense. Like those countries have very strong rule of law. They're typically some sort of dictatorship of some sort. And that has been stable for at least a few generations in the, in the most part. And the energy can be cheap depending on like the situation there. Um, that's why I think why you've seen groups like Marathon move over there. Uh, I believe like the Giga guys are doing some deployments out there. So yeah, I think that area is going to grow. The last one may be East Africa. The gridless guys are doing some really interesting things. I don't know if that's ever going to be at scale. I know of one 500 megawatt deployment in, e- in Ethiopia sounds really ambitious because that area is like not necessarily known for having like very rigorous law systems but i think at the same time there's probably energy arbitrage there and those those areas are growing in terms of like importance for business oh cool yeah i'm glad you mentioned the africa one that was one i it kind of had slipped my mind but i think it was shared in the nest um alex gladstein recently wrote I think just yesterday released a, a lengthy piece, uh, a lengthy essay on um, renewable and wasted energy in Africa. So definitely, I still need to read it. It's on my, my reading list. Um, you know, the halving is coming up. I can't believe, I think Anthony said 10 weeks. That sounds insane to me. I can't believe it's coming up so quickly. Um, I'm 
I'm curious to hear from, I guess, starting with Anthony, like how you think that this having is going to change mining dynamics. Like I, you know, I remember after the, the Chinese mining ban that home mining became a huge um, hobby, I guess, for, for many people in, in America, um, in, myself included. And, um, but residential rates are very high. And now we're, you know, hash rate has only gone exponential since that uh, first drop off when initially banned Bitcoin mining. So like, how do you see the, the mining dynamics changing? Is home mining still viable for people? Or is that just kind of going to go away? What, what does that look like? I think the home mining, well, it's obviously dependent on the price you're paying for for um, your energy, but um, it's 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 going to be a challenge. I mean, that the, the miners we have just already alluded to the miners are already the big miners now are already doing um, everything that we were talking about, you know, twelve months ago on various you know podcasts um, about you know having having the most efficient machines, getting that cheapest energy, and miners are prepared to go wherever the cheap energy is, and you know. Um, you know, Marathon are prepared to go to the UAE to to source cheap energy there. They're now moving into South America. You've got bit farms in South America. You've got mining companies, Bit Digital and Hive Digital in um, Iceland and Scandinavia. You know, they are prepared to go. There was three, I think, three directors of Marathon went to Africa to look at sites there. So they are move. You know, they are prepared to move to where the where the energy where the energy is. Um, but, you know, going back to the, you know, the machines, it's getting those efficient machines because, you know, even the S19s are going to be have a, have a problem achieving a relative amount of um, uh, 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 return um, based on, on their efficiency compared to the, to the, to the newer machines out there. Um, it, again, it, it depends on the Bitcoin price. If the Bitcoin price stays at the 40, is it 42,000 at the moment, it, you know, around that, that mark? You're going to see, um, obviously, the left-to-left left possible miners switch off first, um, which then benefits those companies that have got more efficient machines, cheaper power, because they'll, they'll be able to carry on through. And this is a theory. So, we, you know, we talk about this now, but, I mean, when the Bitcoin price got down to 15000 or 15500 in the 2022, we didn't see many of the miners switching off at that point in time. Um, so whether you'll see the public miners, you know, continue to mine, um, in the expectation that, as in previous cycles, the Bitcoin price hasn't necessarily increased at the time of the halving, but generally, you know, a few months, maybe three, four, five months after the halving, it sort of gets to a place where it starts becoming more profitable. Um, and importantly for these mining companies, cash runway is going to be vital because you're going to have to pay the bills. You can't just use ele electricity and not pay the bills. Otherwise, you get into real problems. And we've seen miners get into problems with the energy prices at the back end of 2022. And we won't, won't need to go in 24. That's been documented well. Um, so having that cash runway, having those more efficient miners, having the cheapest energy. Um, the other thing that we're seeing the miners do now in, in, in preparation for the halving is look at the miners now who are sort of like uh, diversifying into other revenue streams that are not correlated with the price of Bitcoin. And you're seeing miners going to high performance computing. So we saw the likes of High Digital and Hut8, who basically um, had to you know, make a decision uh, when, <laughs> once the Ethereum uh, fork happened and there was no more Ethereum mining, what were they going to do with their massive amounts of GPUs? So both those companies, I mean, Hook went out and bought a high performance computing data data centers and, you know, they're going to, you know, work through that to try and, you know, increase their revenues. Hive Digital have been doing some testing. Iris Energy went out there and bought um, $10 million worth of NVIDIA 100 uh, chips and they've got a plan to, to, you know, they're talking with customers at the moment, potential customers, and see if they can deliver there. But Bit Digital, who actually were doing all this behind the scenes, only decided to come out and say what they were doing when they got a customer. So they'd been planning this for a long, for quite a long time, went out and, um, you know, um, sourced a facility in Iceland. So they didn't build a facility. So there's a lot of, you know, conjecture about miners who, you know, you have to build these tier three uh, facilities for HPC. They've sourced a, a facility. They bought the chips. They put the, um, the, the chips, the servers in that facility. And they've got a customer now paying, um, you know, an annual revenue of about 50 million. Uh, with potential to even increase from that 50 million so that's guaranteed sort of for three years um and we'll probably you know we'll see other announcements from other miners so having all these things together 
put some of the monies in, in quite a good space. I mean, Bit Digital, if the Bitcoin price rises, they are in a win 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 situation. If the Bitcoin price doesn't rise, they're in a win situation because they've got uncorrelated revenues. That's more than going to cover the downside of Bitcoin during the halving itself. So, where, hey, Anthony. Sorry. Yes, Mona. <laughs> They host all of their sites. They do host so the no sites. There's no owned infrastructure. Yeah. So at some point, they could end up in the same exact scenario. There is a huge risk there, right? They can end up with third-party risk in the same scenario that we saw Marathon go through the, like the end of yeah, last year. Absolutely. And, and, and Marathon has still got most of their – well, they, at the moment, they've still got all their machines uh, hosted. They've just, they've just finished uh, two, two uh, closure on two sites, which will give them 45% infrastructure, yeah. Um, I think that's I think that's one of the biggest things that was left out of like the last year, uh, last couple of years, like mining overall, like comments, third party risk in mining is such a big deal. And that's why so many people like had like issues over the past couple of years. A lot of them were private miners, right, that didn't talk about what happened with their hosting counterparty. But they, like we saw it publicly with like Compute North and Core, but there were a lot of issues with that. So like I think that. Th owning your own vertical infrastructure, you're always going to be like one step ahead of everybody else because no matter how good your contract is, there's we've seen multiple times people get the rug pulled from them. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a point. And, um, um, you know, we, we, as I say, the, the, the two that spring to mind, Marathon, you know, have, have you know, their, their, their fee at the moment is obviously significantly higher than the rest of the market because they're paying a, an element of hosting in that fee. And Bit Digitals isn't far much far lower than Marathon's fee at the moment. But um, I think it's something to, I think the fact that having these uncorrelated revenues um, has, has real potential for, you know, for certainly a, a miner of the size of, of, of Bit Digital, where they're, Potential revenues of 50 million outweigh the actual Bitcoin revenues they achieved in the whole of 2023. So um, it gives them some sort of like, I suppose it gives them some sort of balance. Um, and they've got a growth strategy this year to get to, I think it's about 6x a hash. So, you know, they're looking to do that and having this extra revenue come through uh, might get them well on the way to achieving that. Yeah, did you, uh, did you guys notice uh, just, just to make 2024 that much more on brand? that the having is now set for 420 i'll repeat yes <laughs> it's set for 420 because 2024 isn't good enough um but that's convenient because we have to kind of be futurists and we have to kind of uh, imagine you know where really how much bitcoin mining can potentially change the world i know will you were talking about the the appetite for small scale projects in Latin America and the increasing understanding of small scale decentralized grids. I keep thinking about the forces that will decentralize our grid, right? Like what are the what are the the, the economic and physical forces that will push the North American grid, all kinds of different places, to having these more decentralized grids. And, and one of the things, one of the headlines I've been just dying to see uh, come out of one of our Bitcoin shows is that Bitcoin mining is involved in the finance of a small modular nuclear reactor. Uh, what are the odds I'm going to hear that this year? That's what everyone wants to hear on 420 uh, Bitcoin having day or at one of our events or something like that. Just, just this idea that, um, you know, we've got this new financing concept that will allow a completely different architecture of the grid along what you're saying with gridless will which i which i you know everyone loves that example but everyone's heard it and we want to see it scale and now i don't think gridless has to scale it like any guy who wants to buy at the start of this space is amanda you mentioned the one acre lots with waterfalls like i want to put those things together where you know will's talking about the literacy in latin america we got the one acre of waterfalls we got the decentralized forces on the grid. You know, I've never seen uh, what essentially are citadels, right? Citadel talk ever. I've never seen it this rampant. We're talking about Kanye building cities in Saudi Arabia, and and there's all this talk of, um, uh, you know, RFK has a plan to build new cities for healthcare for the homeless population. Uh, you've heard Trump mention his policy to build new cities from scratch. So it's in the air. Tesla, you know, Elon Musk is building new cities. So 
you know, I'm always trying to put that content right there, those decentralizing forces, and I'm trying to stuff it into an agenda in a way that you don't have to be on 420 to understand. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, your thoughts on, on a few of those things, uh, uh, Will? Yeah, I'm actually trying to organize a happening party here in Denver on 420. So I am a little concerned about finding a space to rent that evening. I have a feeling it'll work out, though. I have a feeling you'll have a good time. I have a feeling we'll have a good time. I'm just not sure we'll be able to find a brewery or anything else. That's a not brewery. essentially a, a hot box. <laughs> yeah, we'll find out though. Uh, it'll be a good, a good having 420 party. Um, if you're in the Denver area, hit me up and get an invite. Uh, in terms of the nuclear grid stuff, I I think that's obviously very important and would be a cool idea. It's almost like tech acceleration. You know, you have nuclear and Bitcoin, like internet money, all combined together. I do think it's a bit of a pipe dream, though, in my opinion. Like Going back to Amanda's point, we're really only going to see Bitcoin miners pursue cheap energy, and cheap energy is typically renewable, or it's already pre-built out and abandoned, uh, i.e. like the Rust Belt, where there's just a lot of previous generation that people couldn't use anymore, and that's why Bitcoin miners are there. So like, Paducah, Kentucky, people have been mining there for you know, coming up on a decade now. They're there because there's a bunch of chemical plants that they weren't really manufacturing much anymore. And so Bitcoin miners moved in there and took over the hydropower. And I think there's some coal there too. I think that maybe we could see some of these larger companies like the Terrawolves of the world get more interested in that if they're able to pursue like a public money stance where you know, you're able to go to larger markets and say, hey, we have this idea of building a Bitcoin mine uh, and we want to use a small nuclear reactor for this for reasons X, Y, Z. This is a great project. You should throw money at us. And I think like maybe that is something that kind of could come out there. But yeah, I'm kind of holding my breath at the idea, Nolan, not to damper the, the storyline well, there. I do love it. I just don't know if I think it could happen. I've often had a vision of the Rust Belt being reinvigorated and the infrastructure that's already there putting to efficient use. So um, if, if that's what we get instead of freedom cities with nuclear reactors mining Bitcoin at the core, I'll be happy anyway. I'll be happy too. I mean, maybe there's like a world where one of these small nuclear reactor projects and then, you know, there's a bunch out there, say we can get pretty decent returns in revenue for Bitcoin mining because of how cheap we are. And then they go to the public and talk about how like their operational costs are very low. Now I still think like your CapEx would be really high. And so you might be hiding that from a marketing standpoint, but it's a really cool idea. I just, yeah, I'm kind of bearish on the concept. That being said, like, Amanda just recently was uh, agreed to join the board of TerraWolf and like they're doing amazing things with nuclear mining right now. And so it's still very possible to mine Bitcoin with nuclear energy. Amanda, unbreak my heart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it would be incredible. Um, I think this goes back to the the conversation we were having about the energy companies and their willingness, right, to work with Bitcoin miners. Um, so I think we have to see that breakthrough before we'll see, you know, some of these like Citadel places. But Nolan, if you figure one out, I am fully there. Well, you might you might unwittingly be there already, Amanda. You told me you were in uh, Texas, and uh, I'm not sure if you're there to join the rebellion. But uh, <laughs> here's here's something I've been talking about lately. Uh, tell me if any miners and D plus plus, welcome to the stage. I'll I'll get to you in one second. I see you there as a speaker. Um, so I uh, I've been talking about this for a while. You know, with what's going on in Texas and. Um, the idea for a second that these sort of awakenings of uh, individual U.S. states continue and they start re-exercising atrophied vestigial organs. We know that Texas has talked about minting a uh, coin, right? And they have a constitutional right to do so. And they talked about it being gold back, but that's not really what it's defined by. It's actually more defined by um, it's actually more defined by not being a fiat currency. They can't create debt into money, as far as I understand. But what they could do is more or less a volcano bond situation. If, they, if this continues, the trouble between the federal government and the state of Texas, they could easily, easily use something like a volcano bond uh, to issue money. And I think then you might see Texas's um, 
energy IQ trigger into a whole nother realm because it'll mix with political finance, which is where this thing kind of is headed as far as I can tell. Is that what you're doing down there, Amanda? Are you minting energy-backed coins? No, I only like Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so it's, uh, it's just one thing that, uh, that people are talking about over there in Texas. And we're definitely going to be having a lot of the Texas uh, contingent at our show in Nashville. Uh, I've been trying to get in touch with the folks at ERCOT and, and trying to get you know as many of the Texan uh, energy market participants as we can. So... Looking forward to that, and uh, we love Texas, right? D++, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, D++ ran our Mining 101 uh, exercise at the show last year, and a lot of people liked it because she's able to uh, make it tangible and physical to people so that they understand the actual mechanics and operations of mining. So welcome, D++. Hey, thanks for the warm intro. Yeah, I mean, I understand the cryptography behind mining, but... I don't understand the type of stuff that y'all do and the things that y'all know. And so I am really curious to ask a question about the having or the having, if you will. And I'm wondering, are we expecting to see hash rate increase as it has been up until the having, or are we going to be expecting some folks to continue to capitulate? I mean, or has everybody who's going to capitulate already done so? Are they incentivized to go ahead and unplug now so they can sell their gear for a little more than they might get after the happening? Like, what do you guys think? Like hash rate go up? And part of why I'm asking is I'm, I'm trying to calculate when we think that date is going to be. And it's very hard because we have to try and predict how long those blocks are going to be. And the, all of the different calculators that you can find online are so divergent in their predictions. Some of them are saying April 12th. Some are saying April 18th. I mean, they're just all over the place. So I guess I'd like to hear everybody's prediction for when they think the halving is going to happen and like what goes into that prediction based on what they think miners are going to do in the meantime. So yeah, big, uh, and just to kind of recap, my big question is if folks are going to capitulate, have they already done so? I can start. Hey, D++. Um, I think that miners are not capitulated quite yet because they're still trying to get return on their investments. And also there's not a lot of people um, with money in the space. So like what they might want for machines or for um, infrastructure, they might not be getting ahead of the having. So um, th there's that. On the other side, you see public miners making these announcements that they're going to continue to plug in machines, right? But at some point, both of those, like everything kind of comes to a head where you're like, okay, I'm not profitable. I have to unplug. I think there are people starting to think about what is my, like, what, do, what does my company look like post having? And so there's a lot of conversation around M&A and acquisition, but you haven't seen, well, we actually have seen some of those deals go through, but I think we'll see more of those deals start to go through. And then, you know, the one thing that I think is, is really interesting this time around with the having that didn't exist last time is this emergence of public companies where, you know, they have this balance sheet that can potentially boost them up, uh, making the, the cost curve a little bit different than it was before. Right. So right now you have a lot of public companies, but like hitting the ATM market, right. Like just having, you know, potential like continuous, like uh, d dilution of their stock with the ability to have cash um, to be able to make decisions, right. Grow, expand, maintain that didn't exist last having so last having you really did have this perfect competition where if you were on the low end of the cost curve you are great this time around you know about 33 percent of the network has the ability to tap the public markets which really changed the dynamic overall of, of the network and what i think will happen so i think we'll see more growth um and then i think we'll see a drop off after the having but i think that we'll continue to see growth through the end of the year because a lot of these groups have like plans in place that are not just like three months they're usually like 12 to 18 to 24 to 36 months because of how long buildings take okay that's a really fascinating answer so you're predicting that everybody just fights to the bitter end and i think i, I wonder think so. if that, i wonder if that's what kind of happened in the last couple cycles as well and also i'm also curious to know everyone's prediction date for the having as well i'm gonna say 420 just to be fun 
Yeah, 420. I kind of hope, I think it's like a Saturday or Sunday is 420. I hope it's like a Saturday night. That'd be great for party planning purposes. So let's hope yeah, it's not but, but the thing is, you guys are bullish on this idea that miners are continuing to plug in, and yet you have a very bearish prediction for the happening, given that that's a little bit outside of the range of some others that I've heard. Yeah, I, I was kind of just joking around with you two plus plus, but um, I, I get what you're saying. It's a really fair point, right? If we're saying that miners are going to continue to plug in, then obviously the halving date has to move up. And the, the one variable that we, we don't know and nobody can guess what the, is, is the price of Bitcoin come the half. Um, you know, it could it could it could take off. It, you know, um, we've seen the, the Bitcoin price um, drop since the spot ETF was approved um, sale of uh, GBTC um, Bitcoin and um, but now it's you know whether it's whether it's reached the bottom it starts it starts moving up again I mean any upside is you know it, it makes these comments we're making now sort of void because you know it puts puts miners in a position where they are profitable um, but it, that's the one that's the one variable that everyone doesn't doesn't know and nobody can say what the price is Bitcoin is going to be tomorrow never mind at the halving date um, and that's the challenge that that miners are having to face and get the strategies in order um but yeah it's, it's gonna be an interesting time that's a good point i think another thing that we'll look at is there's gonna be a lot of competition around the uh, having block to secure uh stuff in that block and probably like pretty much around it especially with ordinals and inscriptions and i bet we'll have some like inscription minting events at that time there'll be like a rare sat in there which is already going for a premium on otc People want to put an op return in there. And so I bet some Bitcoin miners are looking at that as like a pretty lucrative time period. And like Amanda said, it's like stay alive until the happening. There's not a premium for hardware at the moment. Like all hardware is pretty cheap. And mine until you figure out what's going to happen on the other side of the happening, uh, specifically with price and then with anything that's like a meta protocol with Bitcoin. So do we see potentially a reorg then for that block? I bet we could see something similar to happen last April, right? Where there was like an inscription minting event and there was a bunch of, there's, I think like three pools were all trying to get the same block. Um, I forget exactly how it all ended up, but there was like a BitMEX research report on it. It was pretty important. I think a watershed moment for Bitcoin mining pools. So, you know, one of the, current conversations around mining incentives and uh, protocol level uh, issues, I guess, or conversations is just around ordinals and this like rare sat market. Um, so, you know, just from a mining perspective, how do you think that the having might impact um this, these dynamics. So for people who might not be aware of uh, the ordinal theory puts uh, a rarity index on, on the first sat mined in the block and uh, it's considered more rare in ordinal th theory for the first sat mined after a difficulty adjusted adjustment and is considered even more rare. Epic is the term for a, the first sat mined after a halving. So kind of, I'm just curious to hear from the mining perspective like, how do you see the, the dynamics playing out here? I think it's going to be kind of crazy. The biggest thing that's going to happen is, uh, apparently Casey wrote a more, one of the Ordinal's creators or the Ordinal creator is launching his Rune protocol at that time, like on the specific block. And I think there's going to be like a lot of craziness around that. I think getting that rare sat could be of interest to people. A lot of people uh, faded rare sats and all the different types of ways of doing numbering with sats. And now they're trading for like pretty big premiums on, on marketplaces like Magic Eden and OTC. Like personally, I don't really have an interest in them, uh, but that doesn't mean other people don't and people are buying them and there's other things you can do with it, right? Like, if you have a bunch of rare sats for people, maybe that gives you like the ability to get into an NF heat drop, or maybe that gets you like free passes to an event, those sort of things. Like we saw all that two, three years ago with like the Ethereum NFT marketplace. And, you know, it was a sizable amount of volume and there was a lot of people participated in it. So I don't think it's something that's not going to happen. 
I just don't have a ton of interest in it. I think from a mining perspective, it's like, can I increase my bottom line or not? And miners will always choose to make more money than less money because it's a very competitive market. Yeah, miners, miners are just profit driven and that's exactly what they should be. And if a miner isn't profit driven, that becomes, I think, a big problem to their overall business. So one of the things I've heard about, I guess, the hypothesis is that like there might be miners who try to reorg the block because they want to get that specific rare sat because they could theoretically sell it on the market for a lot more money than than one sat is worth. Do you think that's a, a concern, Amanda? Well, I think it, it wouldn't be a miner specifically, it would be a pool, right? So like two Bitcoin pools are the only miners. Um, so then it becomes like, you know, pool distribution and who would be the one doing that? Do they have enough capacity or like hash power to do that? Yeah, last time around it was F2 pool and they did it deliberately and even pulled off, if you guys all remember, uh, they pulled off some technical precision where they hashed in at that block the uh, New York Times headline from April 9th or something like that. It was the the trillion dollar print. Um, and they did it in the same format as the Genesis block, like the date and whatever. Um, and I just got bad news from F2 Pool, by the way. Wang Chun, uh, the fella who runs it and travels around the world setting up Starlink satellites in the North Pole and the South Pole. He has a goal to go to every country on the planet. Unfortunately, won't be joining us in Hong Kong May 9th and 10th. Uh, I just got the DM before the spaces, which would have been great. He was the pool that mined the last one, if I recall. Um, so imagine there already was sort of an appetite to, or there was a coveting, let's say, of that block. And it's not that simple as i understand because it sort of happens inside like during a block i guess so it's even more complicated um uh but what i understand is there was already an appetite forget about rare sats and all that stuff so i i anticipate just there's going to be uh, a, a huge rush that day and a bonanza and a, and a potential shenanigans you know shenanigans I mean, what is Bitcoin mining without shenanigans, Nolan? We love it. We love the shenanigans. Well, yeah, so that's what we've got for May 9th and 10th. We'll be in Hong Kong. We'll have uh, lots of pool talk there. We're going to get caught up with the Chinese pools. We're going to get caught up with what's going on with the American pools. Uh, we'll definitely be talking about some of the ordinal stuff, both in Hong Kong and in um, and in Nashville, Tennessee, July 25th to 27th. The Hong Kong show will be coming right out of the having and will likely be the first sort of large Bitcoin event in the world after the having. So there'll be all kinds of fresh takes and new stuff going on. And, and we'll have the answer to some of your questions, D++, I think, and uh, some of the narratives that amanda said will be playing out will have been played out by then so if you join us may 9th to 10th you might have some of this information nolan thanks for having us thanks for coming amanda uh thanks for coming anthony d plus plus thanks for jumping in will will's another fella who's uh giving us uh, some advice from now and again uh, on mining making sure that we stay on top of all this stuff because it's our job of course i believe that these events are taking up the slack for our failed universities and our failed higher education system that simply cannot give you this information in a timely manner. Uh, so we're uh, doing our best to get you all informed on what's going on in the beautiful world of Bitcoin, mining, energy systems. We aim for our audience to be the most financially and energy literate audience in the world. So join us July 25th to 27th. Uh, that's what we got for today. Craig, any last words? I do want to let the listeners know that if you use code bullish at the checkout, you can get 10% off. I'm not 100% sure that that works for the Bitcoin Asia event. It might work as well, um, but definitely for Nashville. So really looking forward to seeing all these speakers and all the people in the audience in Nashville and hopefully in Hong Kong as well. Anthony, I see you got one last thing to say. 
And I was just about to say thanks for the show. <laughs> that's that's what I want to say too. So thanks all of you for coming. I really appreciate all of you for joining us in the spaces today. I hope you got some good value out of this. I hope you learned some stuff. Uh, we're here to help you show how we do our job, show how we create an agenda, show the amount of thought that goes into it. A lot of what you heard here would have been done privately normally, uh, but, and Amanda and Will and everyone, we will have those conversations another time. But we like to show you that we take our time and try and get the best people to help us make the best agenda. And uh, if you join us, you'll be getting the benefit of, we do send these things out on digital though. So if you can't make it to Nashville, there will be a digital version of the show. I don't believe that'll be the case for Hong Kong because it's the opposite side of the world. You know, it's not really daytime there. So we're not sure if we're gonna do a live stream yet. Uh, but everything will be available eventually digitally. So if you can't make it, all this information is free and available. Uh, but, you know, seeing everyone in person and getting the energy and being around Bitcoiners is really uh, worth the price of admission. So great. Thanks for coming, everyone. Enjoy your weekend. And we'll see you next Friday with another one of these spaces.